Bless me, Father. For I have sinned, and I'm about to sin again. This is the story of James Bond if you ordered him from Wish. He's got slanting hats in all kinds of weird angles. Written by Michael Flatley. Starring Michael Flatley. Directed by Michael Flatley. Produced by Narcissistic Ego Productions. Young women can't resist his charm. He's got away with words. Who I am is none of your concern, and what I do is out of your control. Clean up on aisle five. His intelligence knows no bounds, and most of the time he looks constipated. Or does he just think acting is holding your breath during scenes? This is Blackbird, the real life threat level midnight and the worst movie I have ever seen. Also probably the funniest. I'm so shocked, confused, aroused by the mathematical hat angles and completely bewildered that I thought today's video will be a deep dive into this future cult classic. And I'm like putting it up there with The Room, Samurai Cop and Batman and Robin. Okay, so a little bit of context about this. I was Googling what is the worst movie of the last 12 months and this one topped it. And if you like me didn't know who Michael Flatley was, well he's a tap dancing extraordinaire who's created Lord of the Dance. His shows have reached 60 million people and grossed over a billion dollars. He's a multimillionaire who's had the sudden urge to go from this to making cinema. And anyone doing this for the first time may be nervous, the greats that have gone before them, but not Michael Flatley. He's done his homework. And the three films he's ever watched are Casino Royale, Casablanca, and the Oscar-winning Threat Level Midnight. The premise is more complicated than Tenet. He is Victor Blackley, codename Blackbird. And after the tragic death of his fiance at the hands of some random terrorists in a forest, he then goes on a 10 year hiatus from secret agency kind of work. Starts to run a jazz bar slash hotel called the Blue Moon. Definitely not ripping off Casablanca here. He even has a friend called Sam, but he never asks him to play it again. And then Eric Robert playing a playboy arms dealer arrives at his hotel with Vivian, an old flame of victors. And by the way, they have a USB that could potentially kill lots of people or something. Anyway, that's 90% of the plot right there. Now let me walk you through this masterpiece of a movie. It begins with the stock footage of Ireland and ominous thriller music. That's Michael Flatley's actual mansion in real life. Kind of just wanted to show off here. Here's my boy with some stellar acting. I have never seen someone so unconvincing as a man standing by a window. And then we have some weird freaky flashback scenes, his liver spotted hands trying it on with a younger lady. <laughs> and that's some rapist level eye contact. Oh no, we're at a funeral. It's raining, but there's no clouds in the freaking sky. What the hell? is this weather anomaly. This may be the real mystery behind this film. Then we have some shots of the depressed cast of this film. It's not acting. This is just before the premiere of the movie. And it seems like they're all secret agents, but Michael Flatley is better than all of them. There's no one like him. He's irreplaceable. No one can do what he does. This lady looks like she's holding a laugh behind that depressed look. More on this later. And back to Double Tap 7. Yeah, we, we get it. He's sad. And look at all those tilted hat angles. The only time I've ever seen stiffer acting than this is my morning wood. Get your hand off my penis! On to our next scene. It's our cliche love interest at the window. Oh, wow. We're going for the hand stretching out too. That's just iconic. But no, my boy hobbles away like a real alpha male while his mate Paddy hoses him down with water on a sunny day. I think this is why post-production actually took five years on this one. Also, I have to say the cinematography looks very familiar. Hmm. All I wanted was to start a family with my beautiful wife. But somewhere along the way, things got messed up. Now we find ourselves in London. The music begins to pick up. Something dangerous is happening. This guy is on a run. But oh wait, he's comically being tracked by these three men, but literally five meters behind him. Geez, I wonder if he'll ever notice them. I hope he does. And also they must be tap dancers. Look how in sync their steps are. Now that's attention to detail. The man hits a dead end. Oh no, they've captured him. Luckily, this married man with three kids loves his life so much that... I'd rather die. Oh, okay. At least we've handed the USB over to this lady. Wow, this USB must be really important. I care so much about it already. And now we scoot over to the Caribbean and it's the blue moon. Look at our bartender from the funeral. And boy, does he not know how to wink. It's like they told a non-gymnast to do a double back salto tucked with a 360 full twist. Or watching an undercover alien trying to impersonate a human. Apart from that, we have people mingling around and there's a few nice shots of the restaurant. And our boy is getting dressed. That's some Casino Royale double tap seven look. 
But what's this? He's told that some shady guy is going to arrive and stay at the hotel. Likely has something to do with the killing in London, an arms deal or something. All the while making no eye contact with each other. I think Flatley probably beats this guy. He's got the look of one of Sean Connery's lovers. Hashtag rescue play it again, Sam. He then has some boozy night sesh with his crew and young women. Young women, I have to add, that are probably the age of his granddaughter. Then he does this weird nose rub kind of thing with his pal. More on this later. And we now find ourselves in the middle of the jungle where some shady Middle Eastern people are doing doing evil deeds. This guy, like our bartender, doesn't know how to breathe like a human. Again, the casting of aliens is needed for this due to budget cuts, and it looks like they also want the USB. It's got to be some high quality porn on there or something. I hope the acting's actually better than this movie. And it's the next morning, sun's rising, it's a beautiful day. Our strong masculine protagonist is... Meanwhile, the bad guys arrive. Thank God we have a guy who can do what no other man can do. That's walking around with a tiny cup in his hands to increase the estrogen levels in the room. Even his mates are like, what's that pansy doing here, dude? Somebody needs to tell him. And now Victor's hobo friend is the face of the hotel when the new guests come in. Yeah, that seems like a good move. I can smell the alcohol off of him through the screen. We now pan across to the local church and Double Tap 7 has had another change of clothes, you know, because when you go to meet Jeebus, you got to have your best suit game on. The only sin he needs to confess is his crazy dress sense and... Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? And our secret agent has another change of clothes and another tilted hat. Look at that bad boy. Before we reach this iconic scene, I remember every detail of it. The Germans wore grey, he wore yellow, she wore yellow too. Not quite sure who is pulling it off better here. And it's his love interest from the funeral. We feared you were dead. Well, part of me at least. And that is a weird way to start a conversation. Yes, part of me is dead, bit morbid, and I'm sure it gets all the girls wet as a pond. We then have another scene of this fat, bloated old man shaving in the mirror before he breaks the fourth wall. And it looks like he's going to join the 2024 presidential race. Meanwhile, in London, it's their secret agency boss, and he thinks the new guest is... He's extremely dangerous, but this is our chance. We must get Victor involved. But sir, he won't. This will help him as much as it will help us. But sir... Get Victor. I'm up. It's the president. He needs you for a mission. Tell him I'm retired. It's Golden Face. Meanwhile, back at the blue moon, we have this Goodfella-esque shot of the nightlife and the cameras roaming before our playboy villain and his beautiful fiance arrives. Double Tap 7 is having none of this. He casually just walks up there and then grinds up all over her, even finishes it off with this weird head rub thing he did with his hobo friend. Oddly, this seems to be his signature move. He's probably seen it in like the Borat movie or something. So our dangerous and deadly villain is sat there like some old demented man at a retirement home drinking his lukewarm cup of tea. And suddenly the music intensifies. There is a secret, secret agency kind of meeting. This is where we find out what's going on with the USB. This is incredible. What does the ring mean? The ring is a symbol representing a secret society of war criminals called the Crusading Revolution. And that's some Michelangelo level creativity, calling a secret society the Crusading Revolution. The USB thing is actually... A secret formula was stolen in London. When ingested, the formula repairs and strengthens the immune system. A world without pain or disease alter one component and it has the opposite effect. It can decimate the local population. It's called ridding the world of so-called undesirables. What's your point, Nick? My point is... What I love is how he's just found out that this is an evil plot to kill millions of people and he's just like, yeah, um, and what's your point? Hurry up, can you get to the point, please? Does this actually even affect me? How are we going to tap dance it out? And this has got to be the most absurd, wishy-washy plot I have ever heard of. So the formula was created that can cure diseases and pain, but change it one little bit and it, it kills people? What What is that on a disc? What the hell is the formula? Does even does Michael Flatley even know what a formula is? I have so many questions. Our reluctant hero, I mean, I don't even know why they would need him. I know he can do what no other man can do, like tap dance his way out of Alcatraz, but any member of the staff in this hotel would could just walk up to this guy's room, pick up the USB in case closed. I know how you feel, Nick. This plot is making me headbutt the table too. Meanwhile, our hero is having a drink and look at this smouldering duck face he's doing. This is true acting. And what's this? A hot young singer has come to visit him, casually takes off her clothes, but not Victor. He clothes naked women and escorts them to his door because... I... Because his form of sexual intercourse is not exchanging bodily fluids, but this intimate head rub thing he does. I think it arouses his arthritic bones. It's another morning and another wardrobe change and hat angle. Nick really needs to stop it. Nick, stop it! We can't let this happen! Nick, stop it! Hey, 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 hey! 
Hey, stop it. Then we have one of the most ridiculous scenes I have ever witnessed. Did you miss it? Let me just rewind that. In the middle of this heated argument, our hero has a random hat change. No mere man can just argue and swap hats like that. He's the hero this film deserves, but not the one it needs right now because he can take it. He's not our hero. He's a silent tap dancer, a watchful hat changer, a dark knight. Meanwhile, Eric is on a boat. We got booze. We got an incredibly sexy women. Find. I find I always look better under pressure. And he's doing some super cringe things like, Eric, I know you're a seasoned villain who like does a hundred movies every year over the past like a hundred years, but I can't imagine him improvising this level of cringe, which can only mean this is all part of the script and Michael Flatley kind of thinks that this is character development. Meanwhile, our tippy tappy hero has his dance shoes in hand and is on the beach with his gal. Even his masculine walk is as good as his acting. Then we have this dialogue that just feels like the writers are like hitting you over the head with words. We were engaged. Inevitably, they did find out. It was the worst mistake I've ever made. I can't get past this, Viv. Nearly ten years. What about now? You can't go on living without love. It's getting late. We better be getting back. And I've never in my life seen a leading man take a mid-sentence dump in his trousers. Honestly, I have absolutely no idea what I've just witnessed here. He must have just pooped a constipated turd. Is this method acting? Who is his coach? Good on him for like evacuating his bowels. My God, well, we need our souls evacuated by the end of this film. <laughs> Once again, the back of the blue moon. I'm losing track of all these funny scenes. Nick wants to get something off his chest. Meanwhile, Vivian is going through her fiance's briefcase and finds the USB within like two seconds of searching for it because it's in freaking plain sight. In a scene that resembles what it would be like if you gave a chimpanzee the camera and told him to direct it. Victor, meanwhile, is posing for one of his great lines. He was right. What's wrong? Hey, look at me. It's okay. Who was right? I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. This in his briefcase. This holds the formula. It can kill millions of people. How could I? And what I love about this scene here is Double Tap 7 has never seen the USB thing before, never in his life. How the frick does he know what it looks like? Oh yeah, that's the formula thing that's going to kill millions of people. Like, I still don't even think he knows what a formula is. Does he just think it's one of those complicated words that you just say to look fancy? My brain is still baffled. Is it like a DNA sequence? Is it a medicine? Is it a vaccine? Is it a mathematical formula? Flatly, so many questions unanswered. I also love her response to all of this. She finds out the formula can kill millions of people and she's like kind of smiling, kind of like, ah, do I look cute here? Then she's just like, gee, let me just think about all my personal problems. I can't believe I sucked this guy's liver spotted dick last night. And I never thought I'd ever be critiquing a geriatric guy's kissing scene. I have never watched a movie where simple human interactions like winking, looking out the window, dropping a turd mid-sentence seem so unnatural. But my God, this scene that's the kissing scene takes the biscuit. I mean, this 60 something multimillionaire has never kissed before in his life. It looks like his idea of kissing is what everyone's idea of kissing is when they're eight years old. That you just push your mouth into another person's face and just forcefully rub your face against them. Like you're some weird lifeguard trying to give somebody mouth to mouth, but they just want to remain dead because the cringe is too much. <coughs> it's just a lot easier if you just lay back. I feel sorry for the actress. I know they get paid, but there should be like a Me Too movement just for this. And it looks like all it took was subjecting her to this torture and she hands over the USB to him. Like they said, it's a task that no man can do. He then gives it to Sam and he looks like he wants a copy of it. Gee, I, I wonder why no one else has made a copy of this crazy important formula so far. We then have a random suit stare off and our protagonist and antagonist compare who has the nicest suit. The next bit is the centerpiece of the movie, the pièce de la résistance. These two finally meet and it's akin to the 007 and Le Chiffre Exchange exchange of Casino Royale. I'm Victor Blackley. I believe it's time we're formally introduced. My name is Blake Molyneux. Yes, I know. You met my fiance, Vivian? I have. Yeah. So it changed. Wow, the back and forth, the wit, the sophistication. You can cut the tension in this room with a spoon. Why a spoon, cousin? Why not an axe? Because it's dull, you twit! Then it's onto some Casino Royale poker play as they try and figure each other out. Unfortunately for you, who I am is none of your concern. And what I do is out of your control. And I would be inclined to comment on the cleanliness of your attire and the smell. Raise 40,000. Fold. 
finally, someone has mentioned the shit stink that follows this guy around, like a pussy our hero folds. Wait, he has a plan though. You are a washed up, failed secret agent, masquerading as a nightclub owner on this insignificant lump of sand in the middle of the ocean, whereas you used to be the leader of the feared chieftains. I, on the other hand, I buy hospitals and build schools for the poor. Ooh, I'm starting to feel bad for this old loser. Meanwhile, Sam thinks he can do something snooping around, but then he's just caught red-handed. Nice one, Sam. Your fiance's death caused you to retire. Wow. Can't imagine the strain that must have put on your heart. If I said something to upset you, Back at the table, our boy Eric is just laying it into him. He's going for the jugular. I think threat level midnight did it better though. Catherine, don't die on me. How's your wife doing? <laughs> no! Our tippy tappy hero has a plan. I wonder what you love more. Women, money, or playing God. Straight flush, nine through to king. Now the lady who's always holding a laugh runs in. It's play it against Sam. Fine, Nick, quick. Do you think maybe calling an ambulance would be a good idea? Oh yeah, Nick will be able to scoop his brain up and put it into his skull. But thankfully the bad guys forgot to take the USB and the copy of the USB. What a pointless murder of this guy. It's like flatly wanted to tick off another cliche, kill the black dude first. But I think the main plot point here was that he just wanted some hugging time with the young honeys. We then come to the only fight scene of this so-called action movie. Our protagonist, who's probably like five foot six, takes on what is described as an absolute unit. Somebody who looks like 10 times his height. But Double Tap 7 always has a plan and one shot later, The best part about this is the actress can't even hide her laughter at the back of the scene. She's literally bursting out laughing mid-scene. I think they're just as confused as us as to how Michael Flatley's character can just do a one-two combo and kill this guy. No joke, the bartender, who also probably has a dual license as a doctor, pronounces him dead with a head shake. Also, why is he disappointed that the bad guy is dead? Whose team are you working on? Could he be a double agent all this time? The plot thickens. No, no, it doesn't. I think the real subplot of this scene is the background. They must have done so many tastes because they're all still either b about to burst out laughing or shit their pants. I, I can't tell which one it is. But she saves this one with a subtle body shift and tummy hold while our bloated hero just tap dances his way off screen. Then we have this catharsis scene. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And I'm about to sin again. What a line. You have to take moments like that and let the steaming greatness of it waft all over you. It says so much, yet so little. It's kind of like the lines you'd hear in a Johnny Sins movie. Then we have a flashback to the jungle scene where he's wearing a leather jacket. Like who, wait, who wears a leather jacket in the middle of a tropical jungle? His girl has set a light and he screams like an old lady at a nursing home and he shoots her right there, kills her, ends her suffering. Could he just not have just shot himself and end our suffering too? Where are you headed? Peter. You are not a pirate. And what was that noise? Is he like an undercover pirate this whole time? It would really explain that weird accent change he keeps having. Anyway, this old priest dude has just like stop coming back, just just stop changing your clothes and suits and leave this place. And the singer lady comes and tells him the bad guys have his girl and they want the USB back. Mainly because they forgot to make copies of it and also they forgot it when they killed Sam. So we scoot on over to the shipyard for the finale and the best is still to come because this is where the big budget is spent on the movie. All our characters are here. Ahmed, the stereotype terrorist kind of guy. Our play Boy villain. This guy, who I think is one of his tap dancing friends or something. What the hell is even that? And finally, our hero arrives and is. Don't worry about me, son. I'm firing on all cylinders. Where's the formula? Don't just stand there. Find out where it is. I have never seen a hero back out of a scene so quick. He switched on his lorry reversing beeps and just scooted out. I am so intrigued as to what happened back there. I love it because it leaves so much to our imagination. I'd like to think this happened. Also now he's kind of just walked out empty handed and what if he just got shot right in the face? But what if he shot you in the face? But no, the plot armor then lets him speak to his girl and actually saves her life. 
with dialogue that is so cutting edge and unique for the 1930s, and a wink that just impregnates her. The bad guys just casually released her for no reason, but he never rides alone because Nick is here for one last drink. Looks like while Blackbird tap danced the crap out of those three thugs, he also tapped out the Morse code message to Nick. And Nick, who's got the hearing ability of Lassie, was able to pick it up in the wind. But what's this? Blackbird actually gives the USB straight to Ahmed. How could he be doing this? The USB with five terabytes of his porn. If this is not what you say it is, I will be hunting blackbirds in the spring. Shall we dance? Shall we dance? Shall we dance? This is the line of the movie. The audience around me in the cinema stood up and started to cheer. I could hear cheering in the street. The old lady next to me in the cinema had a solitary tear running down her face. I was sad that this experience was coming to an end. These feelings were just tearing me apart. I'd not felt like this since, since the room. He unlocked an old nostalgic feeling within this crappy reviewer. And back we go to the blue moon. The camera dances with us. We want to know if he's still alive. Has he changed into a new tux? What angle is his hat? It's Nick. He's alive. And he's just got an arm sling. That's definitely the best treatment for a bullet hole. And he seems to be okay with a young 18 year old girl hanging off his shoulder. Meanwhile, Ahmed's crew are downloading the files and it's five terabytes of shirtless tap dancing videos. And the girl who can't hold her laugh drops off the USB to the telephone box man. It's mission accomplished. You can laugh now, love. Back in Ireland, look at those hat angles. If you work out the area of the triangle within those angles, you can clearly see that mathematically this guy is now happy. And one final moment to savor and take a dump in his trousers. What a finale. I really don't know what to say about this movie. I've absolutely loved it. And also it's a steaming pile of excrement. This review by Peter Bradshaw of The Guardian sums it up for me. Flatley is able to fulfill a 12 year old boy's fantasy of being a secret agent with a 12 year old boy's idea of what a secret agent actually does. He also apparently won the prestigious Monaco Streaming Awards for Best Actor. And I have to say his portrayal of 007 is the best portrayal of a secret agent by a constipated river dancer that I have ever seen. Because every gunshot you hear in the movie, you have to second guess, are those bullets or is he tap dancing towards you? Seriously, where do I start? For a secret agent movie, the script is the worst thing I've ever seen. It's like the real life threat level midnight, except there's nothing lovable about it. The plot is like terrible, makes no sense. The dialogue is atrocious. The flashback scenes are just so cringe. The directing is essentially someone turning the camera on and going, yeah, yeah, just, just start talking, mate. The acting, boy, oh boy, does it suck. The leading man is stiff as a log and it's like the scenes you normally would skip before getting to the action of a porno. It looks like some of these actors actually forgot how to be human for moments in this film. It's like every actor had that epiphany moment that we have when we were teenagers in social situations like, you know, where do I hold my arms? How do I swing my arms without looking awkward? Should I be holding a drink or can my arm look natural in this position? On to the wardrobe department and what a disaster. When every scene has a new suit and a new angled fedora, then you know something's wrong. Some scenes like this sentimental church scene are just difficult to watch because you're so ridiculously distracted by his suit. I honestly think they had a mathematician on set and their role was to use the hat angles to convey to us how he was feeling through a mathematical formula. Maybe that's the formula that's on this crappy USB in the whole film. That, that would be a good plot, actually. And the budget for this absolute turd fest was like three million, and I have no idea where that went. But you have to give credit to certain things, like the sound was on, and you could hear them talk, and the lighting was good in certain scenes, and it looked like a proper movie at times. That is, if you could ignore all other aspects of the movie. And so what is ultimately responsible for this colossal failure? Written, directed, starring, and financed by Michael Flatley. When you are judge, Judy, and executioner of your own film, it only comes down to one thing, the ego of Michael Flatley. I absolutely can't fathom that no one actually said, Mike, are you sure you want to keep this scene? Or this dialogue seems like horseshit. So either he just dismissed it and ignored them, or he was paying them just to be yes men. This was an absolute vanity project, nothing more, nothing less. And some multimillionaires tried to go to space and others try and do submarine dives to join the Titanic. Well, Flatley decided to give us a gift that will keep on giving. He has made one of the worst films I have ever seen in my life because he had the money to throw at it. Now, could this go down as the room level cult movie? I really don't know. There's something endearing about movies like that. This just feels like a narcissistic piece of work that falls embarrassingly 
short. And the only cinematic universe crossover I would be interested to see is Tommy Wiseau playing the Russian bad guy in Blackbird 2. One of the first things I did was to call my mate and I told him this movie will go down as a great movie and it will join our drinking game list of movies. And if you want a PDF of all the rules, just let me know. I'll send them across to you. This is the only way this movie can be endured. And for those of you who make it to the other side, like Frodo after destroying the ring, you will forever be changed and I salute you for your sacrifice. Click on the next video, which is the breakdown of a terrible Russian version of Lord of the Rings. It's incredibly funny. Thank you and I'll see you on the next video.